This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. Today I have a lost essay from Fulton Sheen. Lost because most of his early writings have been largely forgotten by people. Most of the books of his that are still in print today are a handful of his most well-known books, but this is something written nearly a hundred years ago by Fulton Sheen. And in this work, he talks about science, atheism, theism, and the general theistic tendencies of atheists. Because, as you will hear him describe, <laughs> they tend to make a lot of leaps of faith. In the, same, that would, in the same kind of way that is familiar to those of us who are open theists, those of us who openly believe in God, they make the same kinds of leaps of logic, or sometimes even less logical leaps, when it comes to the mechanics of the universe. The Theism of Atheism by Fulton Sheen No self-respecting periodical that boasts of its 20th century outlook is complete without an article once every few months on the subject, Do We Need a New God? Just as there are those who believe we should change morality to suit our amorality, so are, there are those who believe we should change God to suit our godlessness. Attitudes concerning the new God have been divided between the camp of the fundamentalists and that of the modernists, both of which groups believe that there is no other religious group in the world. It is worth remarking at the outset that there really is another in the world, which numbers over 300 million adherents, and which prides itself on being neither fundamentalist nor modernist, and that is the Catholic Church. It is not fundamentalist because more fundamental than fundamentalism. It is not modernist because more modern than modernism. Fundamental, fundamentalism assumes that the Bible is fundamental. Catholicism retorts, as it is pointed out elsewhere in these pages, that the Bible is not a book but a collection of books. And hence the question more fundamental than fundamentalism is, who gathered the books together and declared that they would constitute a Bible and be regarded as the revealed word of God? To answer this question is to get a body beyond a book, namely a church with the spirit. For Pentecost was not the descent of books on the heads of the apostles, but the descent of tongues. From that day on, it was to be a tongue and a voice, and not a book, that would be fundamental in religion. The church is not only more fundamental than fundamentalism, she is also more modern than modernism, because she has a memory that dates back over 20 centuries, and therefore she knows that what the world calls modern is really very ancient. That is, its modernity is only a new label for an old error. Modernism has an appeal only to minds who do not know what is ancient, or perhaps antiquated. The church is like an old schoolmaster who has been teaching generations and generations of pupils. She has seen each new generation make the same mistakes, fall into the same errors, cultivate the same poses, each believing it has hit upon something new. But she, with her memory, which is tradition, knows that they are making the same mistakes all over again. For in the wisdom born of the centuries, she knows very well what one generation calls modern, the next generation will call unmodern. She knows also that modernism is no more logical than a sect called three o'clockism, which would adapt our gods and our morals to our moods at three o'clock. The church knows, too, that to marry the present age in its spirit is to become a widow in the next. Having constantly refused to espouse the passing, she has never become a widow, but ever remains a mother to guide her children and to keep them not modern but ultra-modern, not behind the times but behind the scenes in order that from vantage point they may see the current ring down on each passing modern fad and fancy. The arguments for the new god are generally twofold. First, the times depend upon it, and secondly, science requires it. Two false assumptions underlie these arguments, and the first is the confusion between a fact and an idea. There is a world difference between God and the idea of God. If I see a canary and call it a giraffe, I must revise my idea to suit the fact, the canary remaining a canary all the while. But if I am an architect, I may revise a house to suit my idea of the house or of an ideal house. In the first case, I change the idea to fit the fact. In the second, I change the fact to suit the idea. The two are not the same. In fact, the one condition that makes it possible for me to change the fact to suit my idea is that I be the creator or the cause of the fact. Applying this to God, the demand for a new God must remain either one of two things. Either we must change the idea of God to suit God, or else we must change God to suit our new idea of God. In the first case, to change the idea to suit God is meaningless if God is unchanging. If he is unchanging, it is nonsense to say that God was one thing in the days of Israel and is another in the days of science. 
This is just like saying that two apples plus two apples made four apples in the day of Isaiah, but do not in the days of Einstein. In the second case, if we must change God to suit our idea, then we create God. Now, this God we create is greater or less than we are. If he is greater than we are, then the greater comes from the less. If he is less than we are, then it is folly to speak of him as a God. As for the necessity of coining new names for God, it is incomprehensible to a thinking mind that philosophy and civilization can be enriched by ceasing to think of God as life, truth, beauty, and love, and beginning to think of him as a blind and whirling space-time configuration dancing dizzily in an Einstein universe, plunging forward along a path of which he is ignorant, toward a goal of which he knows nothing whatever. It is much easier to worship the God who made life than the God who is a space-time epochal occasion. Another assumption that vitiates the logic for the new God is that it hypostatizes science. Modern science repudiates God, it is said. Now just what is science? Renovier used to say, I should very much like to meet that person everyone is talking about, that person, science. They talk of science as if it were just as real as themselves. They draw portraits of its conclusions, sketches of its godlessness. They state demands of its new visions, when all the while there is no it. There is only a there and a theirs. And that means scientists, which is as different a thing from science as John is different from humanity. It is a rather curious fact that the same bad logic that infected the Reformation of revealed religion in the 16th century infects the Reformation of natural religion in the 20th century. The first instance of illogical reasoning is concerned with the necessity of a Reformation and the second with its method. In the 16th century, a Reformation was needed. Now, there were two reforms possible. One was to reform the faith, the other was to reform discipline. The faith was solid. It was, faith, it was the faith of Christ. The discipline, however, was weak, for it was the discipline of worldliness. The reformers who sometimes reform the wrong thing reformed faith instead of discipline and brought revealed religion to the present state of confusion worse confounded. In the 20th century, a reformation in philosophy is needed. Two reforms are possible. One is to reform the principles of philosophy. The other is to reform its discipline or make men think correctly. The modern believes we should reform the principles, eliminate God from religion as we might eliminate animals from zoology, or life from biology, or marble from sculpture. We contend that the principles of reason are sound and the heritage of common sense. What is needed is a little mental discipline, sound logic, correct thinking, and a cessation of anemic reasoning. In the first year of elementary school life, the little students make all manner of multiplication tables, some saying that two times two makes six, and others that four times four makes forty. The teacher, in the face of this mental riot, does not permit herself such broad-mindedness as to believe that the multiplication table should be reformed. She reforms the mental discipline of the children and sets them on the right path. Why should not philosophers do likewise? Perhaps the solicitation to, hamp to pamper the way men live is too strong for them, for much of the business of philosophy at the present time seems to be to give high-sounding names to cover the sins of men. The clay is now molding the potter and the marble carving out the sculptor. Not only as regards the necessity of reformation, but even as regards the method, is there a similarity between the 16th century and the 20th century. Then the various set uh, groups pulled the mitre in the head off of a off pontifical man, and the spirit of unity went out from the body. A new rule of faith was sought for and found in the Bible. The question then arose, who gathered the books together? These questions never were answered. A timid, thin-skinned solution was found by substantivizing the books and calling them a book to make men forget the problem of its origin. Now, in the 20th century, an identical process is taking place. The soul has gone out from psychology as the spirit went out from theology. The soul is the principle that unifies, the principle that grouped together the various findings of scientists and called it science. The problem that arises in these days of soulless philosophy is, who gathered the findings of scientists together and made them a unity and made it possible to call them science? A new solution, a false one, has been found by substantivizing the scientists and calling them science. But this is no real inward unity, only an incoherent, contradictory mass of evidence with no common bond other than a name. The soul that grasped these conclusions in a synthesis of truth has given way to a kind of scientific pantheism in which science may stand for anything. Take the spirit of truth from the Bible and there's nothing to unify the books. Take the soul of truth from science and there's nothing to unify the scientists. 
In neither case is one down to fundamentals, and it remains for certain modern philosophers who are fundamentalists in science to explain the unity of science without a soul, as it remains for fundamentalists in religion to explain the Bible without a spirit. The philosophical appeal for a new god is at bottom nothing but a form of atheism. There are two ways of being an atheist. One is to say, there is no god, and the other is to say, we need a new idea of God, and that God is space-time, or the ideal tendency in things. One of the things I could never understand about this second kind of atheism is how certain minds could admit that the universe is God, and still deny that a man might be God. I mean Christ. Another thing equally difficult to understand is how certain humanitarians could say that God is the society of the millions and millions of persons living today, and yet deny that there could be three persons in God. I mean the Trinity. The denial of God is really not a doctrine, it is a cry of wrath. If atheism means a denial that this universe demands a cause of its being, whatever it is, there are probably few atheists, if any. One of the most famous atheists of modern times, M. Le Dantec, says that, quote, many call themselves atheists without knowing what they mean. Some call themselves atheists when their atheism does not mean the denial of a cause, but only the ignoring of it. With others, atheism is to identify with the law of the universe, as if there could be a law without a lawmaker. But it is extremely doubtful if there are any who deny God in the sense that their denial would simply be that the universe caused itself. Such a position is rationally impossible, for if the, if the universe caused itself, it would need to have pre-existed itself in order to bring itself into being, which is nonsense. One may therefore justly speak of the theism of atheism, for the very denial of God asserts in some way his existence. Suppose I began circulating the country with pamphlets fighting the belief in fairies and ghosts and goblins and cows that jumped over the moon. Suppose I wrote books against three-legged centaurs and against ghosts that floated like ivory soap. Suppose I used the radio to warn the American public against the Sandman who sprinkles sand in the eyes of children after nine o'clock. What would be the reaction of the general public? They would probably lock me up as a madman and as a public nuisance, and rightly so, because I would have proved beyond doubt that I was not well for what is insanity but a belief in the figment of the imagination. Now suppose that God, as the atheists hold, is no more real than these centaurs and fairies. So suppose God belongs to that same weird group of fancies as the three-legged ghost. Now, I ask, why is it that society would consider me not well if I spent myself and was spent in a campaign against cows that jumped over the moon, and yet would not consider the, the atheism the same because he carries on a campaign to prove that God belongs to the same class of fancies and imaginings. The reason is obvious. The atheist is not mad. He is not insane. What I would be fighting against would be a figment of my imagination, but what the atheist is fighting against is a reality, something as real as the thrust of a sword or an embrace. A man is mad who imagines a fancy to be real, but the atheist is not fighting against a fancy that he imagines to be real, but a reality that he takes to be a fancy. In other words, what saves the atheist from the stigma of Madness is the fact that he is fighting the reality by which all things else are real. Folk was not insane when he took gray uniforms at Reims to be the uniforms of an enemy. It is the objectivity of the enemy that makes the attack sane and sound, and it is the objectivity of the enemy of atheism that saves atheists from being mad, though it does not save them from being sad. That is why one may speak of the theism of atheism. Certain things are also fundamental that to deny their existence is to assert them. For example, if I deny that I exist, I imply my own existence, for I have to exist before I can deny my existence. The denial implies an affirmation, and in a still more general way, the denial of the principle of all existence implies the existence of that principle. If there were no wines nor liqueurs, we would never have had prohibition. The very fact that there is a league against saloons, the anti-saloon league, implies the failure of prohibition and the existence of saloons, or at least of speakeasies. If there were never any if any tobacco, there would never be any anti-tobacco laws. And if there was no God, how can there be atheism? Does not atheism imply something atheist? The only reason in the world for loving life and love and truth is because they come from God. And if they do not come from God, then there is no good reason for loving them. The very same reasoning process that makes other things intelligible is that which makes God, who is the source of abiding values and realities, intelligible. Our great minds of today turn their telescopes on Mars and see there's something that faintly resembles canals. They then argue, there are canals on Mars, but only an intelligent being can make a canal. Therefore, Mars must be inhabited by men. Now, I cannot understand for the life of me why, if it is logical con to conclude that a canal builder from the site of a canal, it is not logical to conclude a universe builder from the site of the universe. Other minds are 
are who turn over the blistering sand of the Egyptian desert, discover a few tombs and relics, and then from that paltry evidence reconstruct the nature of the civilization of those days. Now, if this is logical, and it is logical, why should not those same minds infer something of the justice, the goodness, and the beauty of God from the vestiges of those things found here in this universe? If, too, there are minds in the world who believe that the universe is guided by purpose, why should they not admit God? For how can there be purpose without a mind, and how can there be mind unless it be a person? No, a godless universe cannot exist, for it cannot bear the sorrow of not knowing its author and its cause, nor can a godless humanity exist, for it cannot bear the burden of its own heart. That is why I feel sorry for the atheist. He can never say, goodbye, God be with you, to his friends. And that was Blessed Fulton Sheen linking the theism uh, and scientism of our time to atheism and its illogicalness, its lack of logic and its lack of coherence. Another lost treasure of Fulton Sheen from a bygone era. This was written in the 1930s, long before he was on television or even before he was on the radio. Let me know what you thought of this in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't, it does help. So does sharing this on social media, that helps too. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.